Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 500. I hardly can believe that I'm even saying 500 episodes. I remember like yesterday, when we began this program, a little more than 10 years ago, I thought it would last a few months, answer important questions, questions generated by you, and then we'd move on to do other projects. Little did I know that it would resonate and touch such a deep chord in so many. And the best indicator was the amount of questions that began pouring in and the type of questions from the most personal, most sensitive, most raw, painful often, but also very positive ones literally covering the entire spectrum of life. So, Teide la Hashem, I thank God, thank the Rebbe, Chesidus, all the Rabbeim, to have given me the honor of fulfilling this part of my shlichus, being able to try my best to provide, based on the Maimorim and the Sichis and the directives and the Yechidus and the private audiences and the letters, and the different answers of the Rabbeim to address the most pressing and most important questions of our lives. And here we are, 500 episodes later. But as always, I want to begin with dedicating this program with a measure of deep sadness to my deep, dear friend, to our dear friend, dedicated to the loving memory and honor of Rabbi Moshe Yehuda Kotarski Olav Ashol, who just passed a few days ago. And I want to share a tribute to him. And it's interesting, the convergence, 500 episodes, coming Shavuos in a few days from now. Everything has its deeper meaning. And the reason I specifically dedicating this program besides being friends with his dear family and many of his friends who've asked me to dedicate it but my, my own is because I remember when I began this program one of the first people that called me was Rabbi Moshe I know how busy he is and how active he was and we'll talk about that some more. And he said, I listened to the first program, and he had a big yesher kayak to you. He had no reason to call me, even though we know each other for many years. But it was just a sign of the care, without any necessarily reward in return, just appreciating something positive. And for the little I know, how many other people he has called, how many people he has encouraged, how many people he's supported. And he genuinely felt the importance of what Chassidus is all about, which is the essential core, lies at the core of the whole shlichus of the Rebbe's mission, especially in this generation. And I would say without question, probably the biggest Chabad activist, simply a measure of the amount of work, the amount of institutions, the amount of money raised, the impact he's had on shluchim, on shluchis, and by extension on their people in a tireless fashion. So in a program called My Life Chassidus Applied, taking Chassidus and applying it to life, I felt it highly appropriate and fitting to honor this great shliach of the Rebbe's. I was told by his dear wife, I went to visit Shiva on Friday, that he was insisting, even though he was really not well, the last week, 
to go to the oil. And finally, the doctors gave him permission. They had, to, they had to take him there. It was not a simple matter. And why did he go to the oil? You'd think to pray for his health. He went to the oil to thank the Rebbe for giving him the opportunity to be the Rebbe Shliach. And then, then he went over to the gravesite to the, of his brother, his older brother, Yaakov, who passed away in Tov Shechov Zayin, 1967, just, I think, a year older than Rabbi Meshe, and said, may I be Zeche, to what you were Zeche, because when he passed away, the Shabbos afterwards, the Rebbe told his father, Tzvi Hirsch, Hirschel Kutlarski, Dein Sohn hört jetzt Chassidus von dem Schwer in Ganeden. That your son is hearing Chassidus from the Schwer, the Friedrich Rebbe. So Amish is asking that he also wants to be Zeichel to merit to this. I don't want to say a, a eulogy here, not looking to laud anyone, looking just simply to honor a person who dedicated his life to so many. And we may never know how many, because it wasn't done with any fanfare. So the few, as I said, the little that I know, tremendous impact. I mean, we're talking about people who he didn't even know personally, a shliach that needed to close on a building, sent wires a million dollars, or even more. A person trusted by some of the wealthiest philanthropists because he didn't touch, didn't take one penny for himself. Literally giving out over billions of dollars, billions of dollars to build Chabad, to spread Chabad. And above all the lessons that we need to learn from this. You know, I think back the last 30 years Gimel Tammuz, a sad day. So this year will be 30, 30 years. And many people, deep confusion, some people even somewhat resigned, didn't know what to do, what should be done. To the credit of Shluchim, Shluchim all continued working. But if you want a living example, Rabbi Moshe continued, not only continued, but was like a total dedicated soldier to continue to grow. I don't know how many institutions, hundreds, were established in those, these 30 years. So watching that close up, quite impressive. Because there are many excuses. Do we have exact guidance and direction with the Rebbe want this, with the Rebbe want that? But a certain fortitude conviction, even when others have doubts, to know what the mission is, to not uphold the COVID and the honor of a shliach of Chabad, to not compromise in many areas. And despite many challenges, I saw a man that did not rest. That's a tremendous lesson for our times a person who had both the capacity to raise tremendous amount of money, to delegate, and to build many programs, while also having the personal touch. The personal touch of calling someone, knowing exactly what is going on in their personal life, their family's life, caring. So it's worthy to mention this and to honor this, not for him, but for what he represented. May we all merit to have that type of dedication and commitment. Much more to be said, but this program, as Moshe would probably tell me if he heard what I'm saying, he says, stop talking about me, talk about what people's questions are, address their needs, address their challenges. But I did feel important to at least in a brief way, pay this tribute.
may we be zeichet to the fulfillment of what the Rebbe said, shliach, together with the ten kreiches, a shliach with the number ten equals Mashiach, be reunited with the Rebbe, with all the shluchim, with Rabbi Moshe, with all our loved ones, with the gula hamitis ba'ashlema, as we finish the job, to the best of our capacity, of yefutzah ma'inesecha chutzah, and then as Mashiach said, to the Baal who's Yardzeit is on Shavuos. Kishi Futsim and Nesach Echus, so then will be Osimar Dom Malka Mashiach. So to go back now to the 500th episode. So many experiences, so many journeys. I can share many, many stories. Many I know, and again, many I don't know. But to me, it's a personal honor a little of the debt that I owe to the Rebbe for having ignited, having given me the guidance and the clarity and the fortitude to know what my mission is in this world. And I want to thank each of you for participating through your questions, through your comments, through your critique, through your support supporting words, and also financial support. And that is why we launched a campaign. Please go to mylife500.com to raise money to continue this program, to expand it, create many derivatives, and turn it into a repository, tremendous amount of content that can be accessible to everyone anytime to address any question that comes your way. Nothing off limits, nothing taboo. And as I've learned, the questions keep coming because life continues on and life has questions and challenges. So please partner with me, partner with us. I want to thank my tremendous exemplary team, ones that helped me prepare this program, both in research, the production, and all that comes with producing something of quality. And I want to thank all those that participated in the contest that we ran for a number of years. And we hope to continue to run. And above all, as I said earlier, to thank the Rabbeim and the Rebbe specifically gave us these treasures, these resources. to help us direct, guide, empower, to live the most meaningful possible life, aligned with God's plan for us, for each one of us. So again, please go to mylife500.com, participate generously in any way you can. Deeply, deeply appreciate it. But in the spirit of this program, Maybe it's not a but. In the spirit of this program, we're going to ask, address many questions. That is what this program is all about. Before I get to questions, I want to start with a timely question, and then we'll talk mostly about Shavuos and its lessons for us today. And that timely question is about the recent, we can say, a little glimmer of good news from Eretz Yisrael, the four hostages that were rescued just this Shabbos, just yesterday. What sh how should we react to the rescue of the four hostages? Well, the first thing, as we've seen, the celebration of their families, of Israel in general, with all that we've gone through, and a lot of pain, a lot of loss, a lot of disappointment, and seeing this drag on. So to get such a piece of news, that to have rescued four hostages after all these months, eight months, is definitely something to be makertev, to recognize and thank God for. Because it's definitely a miracle. Even though Israeli forces are brilliant and they're tremendous in their strategies, but it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Because you can imagine the enemy, Yemach Shemam, 
have taken the hostages and put placed them amidst civilians all over. That's why you don't find them in one place. So to be able to pinpoint them and rescue them without them being harmed. Now we hope and pray that this should happen with all the rest of the hostages and this war should come to a quick end, but an end, a proper end, eliminating the enemy, Mikol Vakol, completely. It also shows the hand of Hashem, timing. The world, of course, we cannot trust. Look how they criticize. They criticize Israel for saving their hostages, for saving their own people. Others may have been killed. Others were killed. We, we don't even know. They call the Gaza, the Gaza Palestinian health authorities. Who's the health authorities in Gaza? Hamas. So why don't they just say the terrorist group called Hamas said that people were killed in the process of saving hostages that Hamas took. So instead of focusing on the criminals, they're talking about the rescuers. I mean, it would be like blaming the Jews instead of the Nazis for trying to free themselves from the concentration camps. But I think I don't have to convince anyone of that. So we can't trust that world. But here you see talks and pressure of ceasefires. A ceasefire, as we know, is one way to create a ceasefire. The enemy surrenders, returns all the hostages, stops calling for the destruction of Israel. So God helps that just in the middle of all of that, this little piece of good news comes our way, which hopefully brings some clarity to the right people not to pursue these false attempts for Hamas to win this battle, God forbid. So that's the second thing we learn from it. And the third is that we do not give up. We forge ahead with strength. You don't negotiate with Nazis, with criminals. It's just not... You do what you have to do. Hopefully they can identify and find where these hostages are and then decimate the enemy entirely. The world's going to scream no matter what you do, so you might as well do what has to be done. And of course, then comes the longer-term objectives, which requires a total transformation of the Muslim-Arab attitude, including their education, what they teach their children, but that's not for discuss right now. That we've discussed in the past, we will discuss, and hopefully, it will be fulfilled. Okay. So, make a little hefsig ben parsha la parsha. What we want to talk about is primarily going now forth into Shavuos zman matan tedesik. 3,336 years ago. The Eden stood at Har Sinai and received the Torah, God's mandate. We'll be celebrating, celebrating that Shavuos this Tuesday night, Wednesday and Thursday. So let's talk about its relevance, the Chassidus applied, its lessons for us today. The Neshama of Matan Teda and how we can draw from it tremendous strength and direction and guidance and power to fulfill our job today. So the obvious first question is what happened on this day 3,336 years ago? So as I just said, we know it says in Chumash, it says Bechedesh Ashlishi, which is the month of Sivan, on the sixth day, the seventh day, was Matan Teda. Matan Teda, they were prepared themselves several days for it. The great day where it says, You leave Egypt, you'll come to the mountain, you'll serve God at this mountain, where God gives the Jewish people his mandate, beginning with the Ten Commandments, Anechi Hashem Alekecho, Hasharitzisichem Eretz Mitzrayim, and all the other of the Aseris Adibris, which in turn began the process of communicating and formally giving Teda through Moshe, Moshe Kibbal Teda Messinai to the Eden. What is Teda? Teda is the mandate that God gives us how to live our lives, 
a blueprint for life. It's called Life's Operator's Manual. A machine, you don't know how to use it unless you see how the engineer, his instructions, how he built it, told, tells you how to use it, what to do, what not to do. That's the Tata in simple English. But what is the historical event? I mean, meaning what changed? What fundamentally changed? We understand the Torah was given to us. So Chassidus explains that the main fundamental change was an actual reality change. It was a paradigm shift. That up to that point says the Medrash, El yenim le yordu lamata takhtenim le yal lamayla. Which means heaven and earth were two different domains. Shamayim Shamayim La Hashem, Adam. Matter and spirit, matter and energy, matter and the divine were two domains, both created by the Abish. But two different realities. You cannot take the physical world and turn it into a spiritual entity. So as much as the Ovis, the patriarchs and the matriarchs serve God, and they learned and followed Teda as much as it says, even before it was given, but because it wasn't given yet, they, this bridge, this schism, this dissonance between material and spiritual was not bridged. Except the one mitzvah, bris mila, the mitzvah of bris that Hashem gave Avram. Martin Teda changed that paradigm. The highest levels of the divine came downward, meaning manifest downward. They were always here, but manifest in a real that affects the world and the physical world elevated. The Moshe Moshe Amar Alei Alahar, Moshe went up. This symbolizes the fusion and the integration that the way you deal with the tension between matter and spirit is by spiritualizing the material, that material existence, literally, the wool that's used for tzitzis, the parchment, the high animal hide that used for tefillin and mezuzahs and sefer teda, or sefer teda, tefillin and mezuzahs, the money we give to charity, that these physical items are not just symbolic, not just draw divine energy, they are transformed into a divine home. And that's why right after Matan Torah you have the mitzvah ve'ichuli truma to give the silver, gold, silver, kesev, zav, and necheshes, silver, gold, and copper, and all the other physical materials. V'osu migdash, built for me a holy sanctuary. V'shachanti b'seichom, and I will reside, I will dwell within you. Not just above you, within you transformation of matter into energy, into spiritual energy. And the language of Nigla to take a chefze, an object of this physical world, and turn it into a chefze shal gedusha, into an holy sanctified object, to sanctify our lives. So when you ask, why is it important for us to honor it? Because this is a paradigm shift. This changed everything. This gave us the power, and people say, how high can one reach? We're mortal human beings. We're limited people. We're finite. You can reach heaven and beyond. And the reason for it is because God, what language of Chassidus, Atzmus, is neither spiritual nor material. The Abish is not more Rukhni than Gashmi. He's neither Rukhni nor Gashmi and therefore can join them both together. And this is what we honor 3,336 years later, the anniversary of that event, because every year it's renewed, as it was back then, and in, a, and in a more powerful fashion. So what is Teda then, based on this? We know Teda is a set of laws that includes what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to not do, what we have to avoid. Taylor also tells us stories, tells us the narrative from the beginning of creation, the story of Adam and Eve, those generations, the story of Neyach, Avram Avinu, Avram and Yitzchok and Rivka, and so on. The story of Yitzchitz Mitzan, the journeys through the wilderness, the story of Matan Taylor. But what is Taylor Be'etzim? What's Taylor Be'etzim? 
So the answer briefly, as I said before, is the blueprint for life. It says God looked into the Teda and with that he created existence. So if you want to know how to live life, you have to look at the blueprint. That's what the Zohar says. It's talk about Isa Bada Alma. God looked into the Teda and created the world. Kach so to a person, when he looks into the Teda, learns Teda, Kayam Alma, he preserves and holds up the world. That's on a very more basic level. So the laws of Teda and its narrative and its character, personalities and so on are all part of this blueprint. But is that all that Teda is? As one person wrote, from our perspective, we know that Teda is a book of our history and of the laws of how we should live peacefully with each other. But what is the Teda from God's perspective? So that's where you learn in Exodus and brings that Teda has many levels. There's Teda that's given to us as a blueprint with which God created the world. He looked into the Teda and said, there should be light. He created light according to the blueprint. But then there's Teda that's beyond existence. And Teda like Yisrael precede existence because it's the purpose of existence. To the point that Teda is rooted in what's called the Eyeshashuyim Lefonov. Well, yeah, it's like Oman. Uman, as the, as the Medrash explains. This was God's delights, inner delights. Teda reflects the inner essence of what God is all about. So when it says, Ata Reisel Adaz by Matan Teda, I revealed myself. As the Alter Rebbe teaches, You, Atzmus, Ein Sof, Hereisa, revealed yourself to us. Anoichi, as the Gemara says in Shabbos, is the acronym. Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, the first word of the Ten Commandments. Ano nafshi ksovis Yehovis. I have inscribed my soul in these words. So we're getting here, in addition to the blueprint, in addition to all the guidelines of how to transform this world, is the very essence of the, top, of the divine through Teda. And that was given down below, Teda, Leba Shemayim, not in heaven, down below, to use and empower us to transform the material world into a divine home. So next question. Why is it called Matan Teda? Why is God giving us a gift? Matan Teda, the word Matan can be translated as a gift of the Teda like Hashem is giving us a present. But why would Hashem buy us a present? We should be giving Him a present as a thank you for creating us and giving us a beautiful world to live in. And the answer is very clear. It is a gift. Chem de Gnuza, the Gemara calls it. A hidden treasure. To the point that the angels actually protested and said, why are you giving it to the inferior human race? Give it to us. We'll sing your praises. And to the point where Moshe has to answer, as Hashem tells Moshe, instructs him to answer. The Teda was not given for angels. But you in Mitzrayim? The Teda says, I took, him out, took them out of Mitzrayim. Do you have parents? Do you have a temptation to want to steal or murder? Because the purpose of Teda is Savar Kaddish Baruch, who God desired to have a dira betachtenim, a home for the divine down in the lowest of worlds. And that's where Teda was given. So the etzim of Teda is to be transformed this existence. This doesn't mean Teda is, in this, is commensurate to existence. It means because Teda is so much beyond, that's why it can transform existence. So that's a gift. That's a gift from above. There's the efforts we make to make a keli, prepare ourselves, and then there's the gift that comes from above. So it comes the question of the Teda, therefore, is the whole purpose of creation. So why was the Teda not given at the beginning of creation? 
if the purpose of creation was for mankind to make an abode, a home for God in the physical world by studying and obeying the laws of God's Torah, why did God wait until the year 2448 to actually give the Torah? That would mean Adam and Eve, Noyach and even Avram didn't get a chance to study the Torah. And the answer is a very clear one. Remember the Kavona is that we should transform this world. So the way Hashem made it was he created a world. And think of it like infancy. Children start growing. You train them. You educate them. And they have to first make the effort to integrate as much as they can on their own. And when they come by mitzvah and bas mitzvah, now they've been trained. They're ready now to receive the gift from above. So the first 2,448 years was, was basically priming, refining the world from the bottom up as much as possible. Which then would lead, firstly, to Golis Mitzrayim, then Gulas Mitzrayim, preparing the ground, preparing the people. Now you're ready to receive this great mandate. Because the goal is not that God transformed the world, that we transformed the world with the gift of Torah. So first we have to earn it that way, and we prepare the ground. Like you see, young children, first you teach them. You teach them olive bays, ABC. You teach them the basics as they expand their containers, as they refine themselves, as they grow, and the horizons expand, then they can start receiving greater things from the teacher, greater things from the divine, all the way to Matan Teda itself. Okay. So now comes the question the other way around. So if that's the case, why did the Jews have to restrain themselves for three days before Matan Teda? We know there's the Shleish Yisimeyak Bola, which we're in right now. So if the purpose of creation is that man Teda is to bring Teda in this world and transform this world, so why is there a mitzvah of prusha, prusha, to separate and avoid being more ascetic, which seems to be the opposite direction? And the answer, a beautiful answer, that Abba speaks about in some number of sikhas, is because this is the delicate balance that we have to always try to master. The balance between engaging and remaining apart. Because on one hand, yes, we need to engage in the Torah's given dafka in this world. Asceticism is not an option. But sometimes when you are too passionate about it, you could also get burned. And you have to know, when you teach a child, for example, you have to have a measure of extension, expressing, but also restraint so the student can receive it properly. So when it came to the, the excitement that was all building up for Martin Taylor, the Abishter says, tread carefully, step by step, integrate. We call it Vishuv, tension and resolution. Get closer a bit, internalize it. Don't jump too quickly. That way, like think of breathing or the heartbeat. Rotsi Vishuv, contraction, expansion. Exhale, inhale. So because divine and existence are so antithetical initially, we have a tzimtzum. The tzimtzum is a concealer. It creates a certain boundary. Like I said before, the gzeda, the schism, the, the dissonance between the spirit, spirit, and, and spirit and matter for many generations, 26 generations, 2,448 years, Slowly we acclimate ourselves. As you acclimate yourself, then you can go and go into realities that are higher states and absorb it properly. Look what happened by Matan Teda. I'll call Dibur V'dibur, every word that was spoken, Parcha Nishmosam, the Nisham has expired because it was too intense. So you see the need for this balance. Okay. Continuing on, more questions about Matan Teda. And we'll soon see how we can learn from all this regarding our times today. Why don't we dance with the Teda on Shavuos as we do on Simcha's Teda? Someone writes. Last year I asked some, I had asked from fr- some friends why we dance with the Teda on Simcha's Teda, but we don't dance with the Teda on Shavuos. And the consensus of opinions were that on Shavuos we got the Teda but didn't get to read it yet. And on Simcha's Teda we finished reading it. So of course it was celebratory dancing. But that begs a new question. Just the fact that Hashem compiled his wisdom into the Torah and shared it with us as a gift should also be the cause of celebratory, celebratory dancing, even though we didn't start reading it yet. 
someone mailed me a check for a million dollars, I would start singing and dancing right away, even though I didn't deposit the check in the bank yet. After the check clears in the bank, I would have another round of singing and dancing. The Chassidus discussed why we don't dance with the Teir and Shavuos. Answer is yes, absolutely. Keep in mind that Matan Teir happened in Shavuos. Then Moshe is on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Learning Teir with Hashem. What happens down below? So unfortunately, in the day 39, they built a golden calf, tragically. They betrayed God. They betrayed the second of the Ten Commandments. They built a false god. When Hashem sees that, he sends Moshe down. Moshe sees it, he breaks the tablets. It's the 17th of Thomas, 40 days from Matan Teda. Um- unbelievable infidelity, betrayal of the highest order. And Moshe goes back up to beg for forgiveness. The Jews would have to do tshuva. And he tries. 40 days and 40 nights he remains and he's not successful. So he goes back a third time, 40 days and 40 nights, and then comes back Yom Kippur, which is 120 days from Shavuos. And Yom Kippur, he finally prevailed. And Hashem said, Salachti Kidvarecha, I forgive them as you've spoken. He gives them the second set of tablets. And Yom Kippur, and he descends below. So Chassidus explains, by Shavuos, it was done with all fanfare. It was sounds and light and thunder and lightning and ultimately ended up, unfortunately, with the building of the golden calf. Yom Kippur is quiet. But Yom Kippur is the power of tshuva, with tshuva being more like tzaddikim. It was given mamayla, mat and teda, but they didn't fully integrate it. And they were able to betray God. Yom Kippur is now with forgiveness. And this is done with a whole different level of humility. And now you know it's forever. The tablets, the first one were broken. The second tablets remain. So when do you celebrate? When do you dance? When it's been ratified. When a contract is challenged, you still don't know what it will be held, it'll be upheld. Yom Kippur upholds it. And Simchas Teda comes almost two weeks from Yom Kippur which is the celebration of the Teda that was given the Lucha Shniyas. Really, it's a celebration also for Shavuos, but now it's been consummated. Now it's been completed. That's the main, one of the main reasons. So it's also a lesson in humility, a lesson in understanding and appreciating that even when you get a great gift, you have to learn to internalize it, which brings us to the next bunch of series of questions. We know one of the big things that happened by Matan Teda is the saying of Nasev and Nishma. That the Eden said, Nasev and Nishma, we'll do and then we'll read and, under, and, and hear and understand. So there's a bunch of questions about that topic because that clearly means the Jews accepted it willingly. And yet we fought, and, and because of that, it says great things happened. In the Gemara it says that when they said Nasa and Nishma, the angels for Nasa and Nishma weaved two crowns and put them on the heads, placed them on the heads of the Eden because of this great achievement. The other nations of the world were told did not say Nasa and Nishma. They looked at the Teda and they didn't like what they saw. The children of Yishmael, the children of Esau. And as a result they rejected the Teda. The Eden said Nasa and Nishma. So you would think they were really ready for it. And yet we see the Chet Egel. The Gemara says something also interesting. That by Matan Teir, it was still Medor Rabbe Laraisa. They still could have a Tain. Because Kofalem Harkigigis, the Ebershah took the mountain and placed it above them and said, if you receive the Teir, good. If not, he threatened them. So you could say they didn't really, they were coerced. That's why it comes, put him of a Kibla Yehudim, similar to Yem Kippur and the first Luchas and the second Luchas, the same idea that that of a Kibla Yehudim, Kimu Masha Kiblu, Kiblu Masha Kimu, Kimu Masha Kiblu, 
they finally they, they consummated what they received because Purim was done completely at their own volition. So someone asks a question, so which one is it? Did we receive the Torah willingly or were we coerced? How do we reconcile that we are credited with having faith and trust in Hashem by saying Nasev and Nishma, which is very, very admirable, before we even knew all the details of what the Torah says, with Hashem lifting a mountain over our heads and threatening to smash it on us if we didn't accept the Torah? If we had enough trust in Hashem to say Nasev and Nishma, why do we have... Why did we need to be compelled? And then why did we run away from Har Sinai? So the answer the Alter Rebbe says that the Kofal Em Har Kikigis was actually an act of tremendous love. Avarab. So when you love someone, you embrace them. The Ebesh saw what the Eden went through in Mitzrayim. Chesed Nurayich, like a child that suffered greatly. He embraced them, which is a beautiful thing, but it still has an element of mamayla lamata. It's not completely at their own volition. So the attacker said Nasev and Ishma, because it wasn't one extreme or the other. They, of course, wanted it and prepared for some sort and counted down 49 days, and they were ready. But still, there was an element of a deep embrace which gave them kayak to receive the Torah. That's why there was still room for them to be able to build a golden calf and still room for Midor Rabbe that I said, which means still saying, we didn't completely do it on our own. And that's why indeed after Matan Teirah requires the Avoida for us to internalize it. So both are true. So Nasv and Ishma is a tremendous, tremendous thing that they did. But still, the goal is total transformation. That's why we still don't have Mashiach and Gula. If it was a total transformation, the Gula would have come then. Because the point is to internal, entire internalizing. You see this in life all the time. You can have a tremendous revelation, a tremendous epiphany, a tremendous love, and it, it helps you, it elevates you, but still has not been completely internalized. So you can slip. There can be setbacks. So that's the balance that we have to constantly try to establish. So let's do a few questions regarding this Nasev and Nishma. A lot of questions came around that. If Amalach teaches us the entire tale in the womb, why is it a big deal that we said Nasev and Nishma? Why is saying Nasev and Nishma considered such a big thing? And the and also our pre-born fetuses already heard the Torah. So saying we will do and then we will listen is not entirely accurate if we have already listened to it in the womb. So again, it's like saying a child develops, a healthy child in the mother's womb and gets through its DNA and through genes and through everything, many faculties and talents. So it's great, that's a great blessing, gives you a good head start. But you still have to work on actualizing it. And that's what life is about, education, to actualize that great potential. So in our mother's womb, yes, we receive many great strengths. But that doesn't mean we don't get credit when it comes the day and you're asked, are you going to willingly accept this? Even though it's embedded in you, we see all the time, people are distracted with other things. So you get credit for embracing it. That's on that end of things. On the other hand, they said, there are things that were given to us that we have to earn them more. So it's a constant balance between that which is given and that which we earn. Which is essentially read the story of Matan Teir. There's Matan Teir and there's Kabbalah Sateir. Matan is the part that God gives us and Kabbalah is that we have to accept and internalize it through Nasev and Nishma. So let's now go, if that's the case... So someone asked the question, okay, so going back to the crowns. There were crowns that came, that were given to the Eden, which tells you because of their credit that they said Nasev and Nishma, so they deserve the crowns. So the question someone asks is, why were the crowns placed on the heads of the Jewish people at Sinai, and why did the angels and not God himself place these crowns on their heads?
Just looking to see, someone wrote it up in more detail. Let's see the language exactly. Yeah, not, a, not himself, himself doing this. So to understand that, we have to answer another question. Were these actual physical crowns or is it a metaphor for the spiritual level of Keser? What is the significance of the crown? So here, the crown we know is called Keser. What's Keser? When you think of a crown, a physical crown, a Keser lies on top of the head. It's higher than Chochmah. So in the Sphiris, we know Chochmah, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gur, Teferes, Netzach, Yisrael, Malchus, are the Kirchus Primim, we call them, the internal, the imminent faculties, the conscious faculties. Keser is above the head. What is Keser in, in uh, Ruchnius? Rotzen. The Rotzen Hashem. Chochmah is the wisdom of Hashem, which we understand. Keser is the Kabbalah Seil. We accept. Asher Kedushanah B'Mitzvah B'Tzivonu. We're accepting the Kabbalah Seil. Nasa V'Nishma. So Nasa V'Nishma is more than just Nishma. Nishma is understanding. But Nasa is accepting. So therefore, the result of accepting something is you're accepting God's will. Rotzen Hashem. So you get a Keser. However, the Rotzen has to now permeate the Chochmah, so you get a Keser also for it coming down to Chochmah. Now why the angels, why not Hashem himself? Because you want it to be internalized. The role of the angels is to serve as interfaces. In a way, they are like the channels that channel divine energy on our terms. So the Abishta giving crowns, it says in other places, the Abishta Taka gave crowns as well. But you, then you want it to come internalized, so the Kesses started to come through the Malachim. Now, in Kesses itself, we know there's two levels in Kesses. So someone asked, what, what, what is the difference between the two levels of Kesses? Adich and Atik. and and how do you see this in our daily life? So let's go back to the issue. Which, what is the sphere of Kesser, which seems to be a level above the ten spheres? What are some examples of our sphere of Kesser manifest in the world in our daily lives? So we want to have a relationship with God, both on an internal level. Our mind should understand God's mind. That's Chachmah, Bina, Das. But there's also, we want to have a connection to God on God's level of his will. Like he explains in the beginning of Samach, of Ayin Beis, which begins, Bishar Sheikh Dimu. He saw Nasa ben he talks about the Ksarim, that Kesa is Rotzen Hashem. Then you're connecting to God, not as he manifests in the structure of wisdom, but his very will. It's like, I want to connect because God's will. I want to know what he is on his terms. Not as he relates. And you need both, both Rotzen and Chachm. So Tate is called it. In Ratzin itself, there's two levels. Ratzin and Tainuk. Arich relates to Ratzin is more the will that Marutza, that Ratzin is the extension of his will, what he wants. Tainuk is more of an internal, even in the in, in the etzem, in the level of Maki from itself, it's deeper than Ratzin, it's Tainuk. The Tainuk Hashem, Shashrim Lefonov, as we learned before, as we discussed before. So you have both ksarim, both levels. So someone asks, being that the Rebbe Rasha began the Ayin Beis, Mayim and Ashvuas, and he starts it with questions about the crowns we receive for saying Nasev and Ishma, can we ask Rabbi Jacob to give a brief synopsis of what these crowns are and what their relationship is to the Sphere of Keser? So basically what I'm saying now is coming from there, but there he goes and later explains in the Mayim of Vayigash, of uh, Vayigash Ayin Dawid, which is a, at the end of one part of the Hemshech, that there's really three levels. There's Arich, that's the divine as it relates to existence. There's Atik, the divine on its own. Then there's divine completely beyond. And that's the three meanings in the word Keser, as he explains in the beginning of the Hemshech, which we're not going to go into right now in detail. So the bottom line, it's all about an interface between divine and existence. An interface has to be on our terms, has to be on terms of the, in the case of the Mashpia, the Eberster, and it has to be something that joins them both together. And hence the two, that leads into three. Okay, good.
Now, let's go back to the discussion we said before that God offered the Teda to other nations. And they did not accept it, though the Eden said Nasa Venishma. Why did God offer the Teda to other nations? When he knew they wouldn't receive it. And what happens if they would say yes? What would happen with the Eden? So the different answers given, one of them, based on the Zayad, Samach Tzedek, and Eda Teda Baruch says, that Abishta knew that, but he was paving the, ra- the road. He was preparing the ground. He wanted the nations ultimately to embrace the Sinai message. That's why the Rambam Paskins and Sev Peter Ches, the end of chapter 8 of Hilchas Malachim, that just as there's a mitzvah to do mitzvah, there's also a mitzvah to Eden to influence non Jews to do Shev Mitzvah B'nei Neach, because they were given at Sinai, he says, not just because it's a moral obligation. That's also part of Har Sinai, also part of Matan Taylor. But they weren't ready yet. They weren't ready yet. So they wished to pave the way by offering it to them. They rejected, but the kavanah was that ultimately they would accept it. So the idea of oz epech el amim sofa bruder, that koyach came by matan teda. The koyach. That's why the whole world felt matan teda. The world came crying because the whole world got silent by matan teda. They came, came crying. They became, came running to, to Abilam. What is the silence? And he said, Hashem is Lama Yitna Hashem Yivorech Hashem Yivashalom, the Abish is giving Tater. Why did they need to know this? Because it wasn't just for the Eden. It was for the whole world. It was to transform the world. So Tzipra Le Tzifzif, the birds were quiet. Everything came to a pause. Everything was affected. But it would take time until the nations of the world would embrace it. And Taka Bnei Esav would embrace it, the Chathchila, like through Christianity, like the Rambam says, in Sof Hilchus Melochim. And then seven, seven centuries, six, seven centuries later, B'nai Yishmol, that they, with all their flaws, there's the concept of liyashir asaderach. They helped pave the way to Mashiach, to the belief from paganism, to some form of unity of the divine Mashiach, and so on, as the Rambam explains. It's censored in some of the prints, but if you go to the Fusremi, ironically, there the, you have the whole text. So that's uh, the, one of the main reasons. So then somebody says, asked like this, what would have happened if Hashem offered us the Torah and we said, no thanks? In other words, is it possible that the Jews would have chosen not to receive the Torah? Going the other way around. The answer is absolutely not. They were ready for it. They wanted it. But someone writes, hypothetically, what would have happened if they said, no thanks, we don't take it because then we will become a target of every evil country and organization in the world that doesn't want holiness revealed in the world. Okay, one of the tongue-in-cheek questions, probably the same guy writes these type of questions. We would rather peacefully shepherd our animals than have to deal with violent pogroms. So, hypothetically, maybe the Jews wouldn't receive the Torah. So the answer is absolutely not. I'm just reading it for a little to humor us all. Would Hashem have just continued offering the Teda to other groups until someone agreed to take it? Or would Hashem have gone into, into become upset and threatened to destroy the world? The answer is that the Teda was going to be received, the condition of existence that Teda would be received, the to knew it would be received, and he knew the nations would reject it. And the Eden Taka Nasev However, as I said, it still needs to be internalized. That's why there's still challenges. Even till today we receive the Teda and we don't... We're far from perfect. We're mamlechus came with gay others, but there's still work to be done. Okay. Let's see if there are any more questions here. Okay, we'll talk about a few other things now that we've covered that. But first I want to just take a lesson from all of this. The lesson is like this. Number one. How many people can say that they have a mandate given to us Literally 3,336 years in an unbroken chain, a Meseda, Tere Shebik Sav and Tere Shebal and everything that has happened in between over these generations. A Tere that traveled with us, that gave us the power to deal with every challenge. So, number one, we need to know what we have. Tere Tsivalon Omesh, Meroshik Hilis Yankiv, we have a tremendous eternal Eitz Chaim Hilam Achzikimba, tree of life that gives us life. At the same time, we have to know that our job is to internalize Tehra. 
as much as possible. It should refine our personal lives. It should refine our relationships. It should refine our interactions. The fact that we still have some battles to fight means it's not fully, but it's right close to it. And we see, ultimately, the Bnei Esav and ultimately the Bnei Yishmael will embrace it fully. And we as Epech Alam Safa Beruda. But we have to continue forging ahead, knowing we're going strong and standing with Teda. But we go with the name of Hashem and with the power of Teda. So that's on a very basic level. So Shavuot gives us power to fight all our battles. But we fight it with the Koyach HaTeda. So let me just do another two questions. And then we can conclude this historic episode. And that is, what shape were the tablets? I know it may not fit into the context, but someone asked that question. So you see in many places, you see the tablets look like tablets with round tops. The Rebbe made it a very big point. That's not correct, and it should be corrected. Based on the Gemara and Baba Basa, where it says that the luchish, a chiles means they completely consumed the un. The un, we know, was square, was not round on top. If the luchas were round, then there'd be space. It wouldn't be a chelis. It wouldn't be to the forest edges. In addition, we know in the Mishkan, the Mesa Migdash, there was no extra space, anything. Everything was perfect. Perfectly fit, because in Gedusha, everything is perfect. The Eris and Kalim are completely aligned. So based on this Gemara, you have to say, just like the un was square, the, the, the luchas was square. Now, why is that the case? So again, it's a certain element of perfection. To go deeper, there's the concept of marubah and eagle, but marubah is that you are manifesting the divine within the structure of existence. So someone asked, what, someone asked the question, is there a disagreement with the shape of the tablets of the Ten Commandments and whether they were square or round? Or why does it matter? Shouldn't the only thing that matters be the words and content of the Ten Commandments so we can know what God wants us to do and what we shouldn't do? Why does their shape matter? So obviously the main thing is, of course, the contents. But shape matters because the shape indicates things. Like I just said, the Gedusha, you don't want to have any extra space. And squares, I said, fo- focuses on integration. That's the key thing with when you're talking about a square. In a circle, there's no top and bottom. Even though this isn't a complete circle, but the top would be circular. That's the basic answer. And finally, I'll take the last question here. Why do we read Megillus Rus, the book of Ruth and Shavuos? I'll do one more question after that too. And the answer to that is, primarily because the Yidin were like, there's many reasons given, but one of them was because the Yidin were like a Gerim Shen Gairu. By Matan they became a new people. Before that, there was no real legally, legal category status of a Jew. There was a Jew in spirit, but they became Gedim. And Rus is the story of Gedus. What's Gedus? Gedus means it's at your volition. You're not born into it. You want it. It demonstrates also an element of integration. That's one basic reason. Another is the transformation element. You know, we know from Rus, she came from Moyav. So it says Mashiach will come from David, whose grandmother was Rus. So the Gemara says, explains, we gave to Avadja. He was a Ged, he was a Ger Tzedek, he was a convert, and yet his prophecy, he was a prophet, are the greatest prophecies. So the Gemara says, why? Even greater than the prophecies of Yeshaya, Yecheskel, Yemio. So it says, When you want to cut down a tree, you need the wood of the tree to cut it down. That's the handle of the axe. So it also indicates on the Oz Epech El Amin that I spoke about before, the transformation of the nations that Matan Teda accomplishes. It's not just for transforming Yidin, but transforming the entire world, including Umar Se'ela. And the final question I will say, in the last week of Svira, when we focus on Malchus, is it connected, is the last week of Svira, when we focus on Malchus, connected with Mashiach? Since we are taught Mashiach is supposed to be a king, has the Rebbe ever said that the week of Svira where we refine all the dimensions of Malchus would be a perfect time for Mashiach to come? The answer is absolutely yes. After seven weeks of counting, the last week is Malchus. 
and makes sense because Malchus leads us into Matan Teira. Matan Teira is the beginning of Me'ikfar Hoya Le'elom Me'enzeh by Matan Teira, says the Alter Rebbe in chapter 36 in Tanya, a taste of the Geula. So after finishing refining Chesed, Gvurah, Teferes, Netzah, Ched, Yosei, we come to Malchus. And to Malchus, Sheba Malchus, which leads us right into Matan Teira, the Yem HaChamishim, the 50th day, which is the Gili of Matan Teira. So it's very appropriate for that. And after 3,336 years, we now have the ability to say we're at the threshold. Otot. Just one more drop, and we shall come to the complete conclusion of this marathon called Golos and march into the Gula Amitis Vashlema. And as we see that our Aveda and our prayers are working, including the freeing of the hostages, including the ultimate success and victory in the Gaza. And we'll speak about this more in, in coming programs. And with that, I'd like to conclude again. Everyone should have Kabbalah Sateh, Besimcha, Bepinimius. Especially Hashem should protect our holy soldiers in the Holy Land who are defending and sacrificing themselves to protect men, women, and children. Hashem should protect them, Yidden everywhere. We should indeed, even before Matan Teda, march into the Gula Amitis Vashlema, Mobizechet, to Teda Chadoshimit, Teitse, and a whole new paradigm, a whole new reality of total peace and harmony in this world. Everyone have a Freilich in Yontif. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. This has been My Life Chsidis Applied, episode 500. And please, partner with us in honor of Yontif coming up, in honor of this special program, mylife500.com. Gener- donate generously so we can continue to grow these programs in reach, in quant- quantity, and in quality. I've gotten Yontif and I've gotten Tomid.